Well, good morning, church. Y'all look so pretty today. Of course, I'm talking to the girls and the ladies. Guys, you look okay. But beautiful day. We're glad to be together. You know, we celebrate an anniversary today. Um, not a wedding anniversary or even like an anniversary of a congregation's founding or anything like that. Uh, the anniversary that I'm referring to, we actually celebrate every Sunday, every first day of the week, the day we call the Lord's Day. Why do we call this the Lord's Day? Because 2,000 years ago, our Lord, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, rose from the dead. He died on a Friday. He rose on a Sunday. And that was the final convincing, clinching proof of who he really was. He was the Lord of all things. Now he appeared after his resurrection to more than 500 people. All of them were alive at the time of the writing of this book that we have before us, the New Testament, if any of them could have been proven a false witness, they would have been. But they weren't. The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is one of the most verified facts of history known to man. We have more objective proof that Jesus lived, died, and lives again than we do that George Washington ever lived. Maybe you've not thought of it like that, but you've never seen a photograph of George Washington or a video. You've seen paintings and things like that, but we have more objective proof that Jesus lived, died, and lives again than Washington ever existed, and I fully believe that Washington existed, that he lived and that he died. You can go to Israel today, and you can walk those dusty roads, and you can see those faith-inspiring sights, Go to a lot of great places. You can go to the place where the temple stood. You can see the rock on which Abraham sac almost sacrificed Isaac. You can see uh, a jagged cliff face that sort of looks like a skull, which some say is the hill of Calvary, Golgotha. You can see very nearby there a place now called the Garden Tomb, the supposed burial place of Jesus. But there's one thing you cannot see, one thing you'll never find, no matter how long you search, no, how, no matter how hard you work, or how much money you spend, and that's a body. The tomb, if we could ever find it for sure, is empty. Christianity is the only religion with an empty tomb. The bodies of all the founders of, of every other religion in the world today are to be found someplace, but not Jesus. That's why this is the Lord's Day. Now, some of the greatest sections of Scripture, as you might expect, describe Jesus' appearing uh, to his various followers after he rose from the dead. And I'd like to tell you a story this morning of one of those appearances. It's uh, one of the, the richest stories in the Bible and I think there's a lot for us to learn here in this account. It's told, written down in Luke chapter 24, if you want to follow along. I'm going to retell it 
in sort of my own words, but you'll see that it follows right along with the text in Luke 24. This story happened on the very first Lord's Day. The very day that, that Jesus rose up from the tomb, conquering death. There were two of his disciples that were walking away from Jerusalem very dejected. They were sure their entire lives were over and that they had indeed wasted the last years of their life. They had seen Jesus, who they believed in, tortured and killed on a Roman cross just a couple of hours before. This crushed them, crushed all their hopes. They were speaking to one another as they walked away, sort of with their tails tucked between their legs, hurt like they had never been hurt before. Suddenly, there was a stranger with them, walking alongside them. It was actually Jesus, though, they didn't know it. His, his identity was hid from them as they walked and as they talked. He asked them what it was that they were discussing. And they couldn't believe that there would be anybody in and around Jerusalem that weekend that didn't know what had taken place and all the awful events. So... They began very sadly to retell the tale about Jesus of Nazareth, the mighty prophet of God, the wonderful rabbi, and how he had been arrested Thursday night and convicted in the wee hours of Friday and then crucified for all to see during six awful hours that very day. He had been buried that same day and had been in the tomb ever since, three days dead, as dead as dead could be. And the two disciples told this interesting stranger how some of the believers were saying something strange had happened at the tomb. Angels were involved, and, and some were saying that his body was missing. No one had found him yet. And it was then that this man spoke. And shockingly, he called them fools. And he rebuked them for not believing the prophets. And, and he shamed them for not knowing the nature of their own Messiah. And then he started preaching to them through all the scripture, starting with the books of Moses and, and going through all the prophets, interpreting what they all said about the Messiah. So when they came near the village that they were traveling to, this visitor, he seemed to be heading on down the road, uh, when the disciples stopped him and they begged him to come stay with them, and he did. That evening they sat down to a meal, and when they did, the, the stranger took the initiative to say the prayer and to break the bread. And as he did, at, at that very moment, their eyes were opened and they realized that the stranger wasn't a stranger at all, but in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ. As soon as they realized this, he disappeared from their sight. And so they started talking to one another again, and, and they said, we knew there was something special about this one. As he walked with us, and as he talked to us, and as he opened the scriptures to us, and so these two disciples reversed course and in the dark of the night they hightailed it back to Jerusalem and they found the apostles and they told them what they already knew 
that Jesus was alive. Great story, isn't it? It's inspiring to me to think about those days, those 40 days when Jesus walked the earth once more after he rose. And there are a few things I'd like you to notice about this encounter with Jesus that those two disciples had. And there are three things that are, that are very similar to our own relationship with Christ sometimes. I want you to notice first that, that Jesus in the story was unexpected. He was unexpected. That's really the most amazing part to me as I meditate on this passage. These disciples, remember, had seen all the miracles. And they had heard all the teaching of Jesus. They thought, despite all that, that he was really gone for good. You know, he had told them that he was going to suffer and that he was going to die and that he would then be raised again. He told them at least three times that this was going to happen. But they weren't expecting it. They weren't looking for him. They were instead leaving Jerusalem, walking to this village of Emmaus and talking dejectedly about what had happened. Can you imagine the kinds of things they were saying to one another? Oh, they killed him. Oh, they hung him on a tree, which to them was a great curse. We thought he was the one who had kicked the Romans out of Israel and be the next great king in Jerusalem, and now it's never going to happen. So they are depressed. They are crushed. They're moping They're feeling sorry for themselves. You can imagine all the emotion. They were too pessimistic even to believe the women who had been at the tomb that very morning already and had seen the angels. And the angels told them what happened, that Jesus was alive. They didn't believe They had given up, you see. So much so that, did you notice in verse 19, Luke 24, what they, how they describe Jesus now? He was a prophet, you see, just a prophet. Have you ever acted like that? You ever felt like they felt? Ever been so disappointed, so bitter, so distraught over circumstances that you actually became pessimistic about your faith, about your God? Saying things like, oh, it does me a lot of good to be a Christian. I can barely make ends meet. Still got problems with family. My health is so bad. And on and on we can... Make the list, can't we? Now, this Christianity, it's really not all it's cracked up to be. I'm just going to give up. What's the point in trying if this is what it's going to be like? It's when we feel like that, when we're walking around with long faces or a big chip on our shoulder, It's at that time that we fall into the trap that these disciples did. We don't even expect Jesus. We quit expecting him to work in our lives. We quit expecting him to assist us in our families, to work in our church, to to help us make ends meet, to help heal us or those we love so dearly. We don't expect him to do it. We don't pray that he will. It's just like, what's the use? And there he is, walking right beside us on the road. 
waiting for our eyes to open. First thing in this story, Jesus was unexpected. Notice, secondly, that Jesus was unrecognized. He was unrecognized. This is a direct result of number one. Because these disciples weren't expecting Jesus, they weren't expecting to see him, they didn't see him. Verse 16 of the text, what does it say? Their eyes were kept from, from recognizing him. Now, is this simply a function of they're not expecting to see him? Probably not. It seems that God had a hand in, in their blindness here, but, but why would God do something like that? Because, probably, of their lack of faith at the moment. They didn't expect to see him, so they didn't get to see him. They were spiritually blind here. They were unprepared to see Jesus. They didn't even recall the scripture. The scripture that, that Jesus taught them from daily, they didn't, didn't recall from Moses and the prophets. They were just so caught up in their emotions and in their disappointment that they couldn't quite put it together that Jesus was supposed to suffer and that he was supposed to be then glorified. Just like he had told them. Well, Jesus calls them something interesting. If you look at verse 25, our translations say fool or something like how foolish you are, but the word actually means dull or obtuse. Uh, I remember my dad saying to me, Mark, don't be obtuse. And after I looked it up in the dictionary, I realized what he was saying. Jesus says to these guys, you guys are obtuse. How many times do you have to be told? And so they don't recognize him because they weren't prepared to spiritually. You see, Jesus is known or recognized only by revelation. So what does he do? with these two blind disciples. He gets out a Bible. Now, now watch this. He, he gets, gets out the scripture and, and he starts with Moses and he works his way through the prophets, which is in their lingo is referring to the whole Bible. From Moses to the prophets, and he says, you see, you remember? Remember what the text says? This is supposed to happen. Well, I wish I could go on YouTube and watch that lesson. Love to see that lesson, how powerful it must have been for the very word of God to take God's word in his hand and explain it to show these two poor blind men who he really was. Faith in Jesus is not coerced. It's not forced. He will not overwhelm you in some better felt than told experience. Instead, it's still true what the scripture says. So then faith comes by hearing. And hearing by what? By the word of God. Let's do that again. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by? That's how we learn of God. That's how we learn of his son. It's how these two had their eyes opened to what was right in front of them. That's how it works. You want to recognize Jesus in your daily life? You want to see him at work in your life in a real way? You've got to get to know his word. 
You, you have to be familiar with his revelation. Ever feel like Jesus has no relationship to your work or your family or whatever? You need to get into his word. You need to prepare yourself spiritually to recognize him and his work. How do we get from verse 16 in this story where it says, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him to verse 31 where it says, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. How do we make that transition? The key is in verses 31 and 32, where the exact same word, opened, is used in two different ways. In verse, 30, verse 31, their eyes were opened, and they finally recognized Jesus. In verse 32, they tell how this happened. Look at what it says. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? To open their eyes, Jesus had to open the scriptures. To open our eyes, we have to do the same. I noticed that it's pretty full in here this morning. Praise God. I also noticed that when we assemble for times of Bible study, it's not as full. There's plenty of room for you. Let's resolve this morning that if we need to do that, it, if we're tired of walking around with spiritual blinders on, that we'll begin to study and pray as we ought. So we can both expect Jesus to work in our lives and then recognize him when he does. Because he's working. Finally, on this Lord's Day morning, one more thing I'd like us to see from this, and that's how Jesus is uninvited. Now, you might be looking at the text, and hope you are, and say, wait a minute, Mark. There in verses 28 and 29, these disciples, these two disciples beg Jesus to stay with them. They, they invite him to spend the night in Emmaus, and that's right, you're reading it correctly. But this time I'm not talking about these two. I'm talking about you and me, us. It's true that these two hadn't expected Jesus and hadn't recognized him. But they didn't make the third and most crucial mistake that they could have made. They could have let him go on down the road. But instead, they said, wait, there's, there's, something, there's something special about this man. Let's ask him to stay. So they asked him. They invited him. And he revealed himself to them. And it closes by saying they went on their way rejoicing. Well, what about you today and me? Is he invited? Is he welcome? That would be the worst mistake, to fail to make that invitation. And I want to close the message by asking you to think about that. Is he welcome? Is he invited? 
He stands at the door and knocks. Your choice whether to let him in. Would you pray with me a moment? Dear God, thank you for this day of yours that you let us be a part of. Thank you for the time of assembly. Pray that we're encouraging one another and building one another up in the most holy faith. And Help us now as we consider our relationship with your son, whether he is truly Lord of our life or not, whether we have obeyed him and are living with him. Thank you for all your love. We thank you that he died for us, and we thank you that you brought him back. Please inspire us to live for him this week. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need to respond publicly this morning or to ask in private for help, whatever it might be, this is your time. While together we stand, we sing this song.